Over a hundred years ago, America inaugurated the 20th century with a raucous epoch of unrestrained capitalism based on the politics of business. A surge of great industrial monopolies deconstructed the Declaration of Independence into the broken promise of a young democracy. As a consequence, working men, women and children became exploited. And the opportunity promised by the statue in the harbor was denied to many for the advantage of the few. Nowhere was this more evident than in the lives of the people who worked in the anthracite coal mines of northeastern Pennsylvania. The story of these emigrant anthracite miners and their families inspired a conflict of social forces that dug into the source of power stretching from Wall Street to Pennsylvania Avenue and stirred the American people to serve justice in a place where sunlight has never reached. Against the backdrop of America's evolution as the world's dominant superpower in the 20th century, the conflicting interests of capitalism collided with the discourse of people dedicated to restoring human rights sacrificed in the country's effort to secure its position in the world. In this historic struggle, the weapon that both wielded was anthracite coal. Though it existed in Great Britain and Europe, as well as in New England, the Southeast and the Southwest, virtually all known reserves in the world existed under only 500 square miles and five geologically diverse counties of northeastern Pennsylvania. With half of the country's population living within 300 miles of these centralized deposits at this time, Industrialists in New York City created giant integrated firms to launch America's industrial revolution in coal and iron. By the start of the 20th century, the United States overtook Great Britain as workshop of the world. Industrialists rallied around the idea of social Darwinism, which compared business to nature. The strongest survive and the weakest do not. One industrialist who also embraced this standard was John Pierpont Morgan, the world's most powerful banker, and who some believed was even more powerful than the President of the United States. Morgan had three rules for conducting business. His company must dominate the board of directors, competition must be subdued, and costs must be minimized. The anthracite industry's golden age spanned the first two decades of the 20th century. Underneath a 25 square mile area of the city of Scranton alone, enough anthracite was mined by 1912 to fill almost the entire Panama Canal. But this prosperity came at a remarkable cost. Widespread violence in the southern counties of the anthracite region was frequently front page news after the Civil War. A secret society of Irish immigrants there, called the Molly Maguires, was accused of waging a civil war of intimidation and revenge against coal company officials. Coal and rail operators Politicians and pro-railroad newspapers blamed the terrorism on labor unions to incite an anti-labor sentiment in a public already in fear for its life. Beginning in 1876, this social prosecution became a legal persecution. The investigation and trials of 20 accused members of the Molly Maguires for murders were carried out entirely by allies of the anthracite railroad and mining companies. The state supplied only the courtroom and gallows. Five minutes, Campbell. Alex, I've uh, just seen your wife outside. She told me to make ready for an uh, Irish wake, the likes of which uh, Lansford has never seen. Lots of tobacco. And whiskey, too, Father. Amen. Have one yourself? I think I, 
I might have to have one myself. Hagen can't hurt any worse than saying goodbye to me, wife, father. I'm already dead. God, we will have mercy on your soul. It's not mercy I'm needing, father. It's justice. I know. Oh, I know. Ambition through Satan over the walls of heaven. Your accusers will face the same doom. The railroads and the coal barons can get rid of me and Kelly and Doyle and Donahue. They want to keep us down. But they can't hang the whole county. Sometimes I get the feeling the same thing would have happened if I stayed in, in Ireland. But then again, you would have never met your wife. Have you ever seen a miracle, Father? No, I never have. Let me show you one then. Okay, Camel. Stand against the back wall while I open the cell. Father, have you seen Kelly and Doyle already? Yes, Sheriff. What are you doing, Campbell? I was not party to the murders I've been convicted of. And so you too are murdered another innocent man. And as a sign of my innocence, this mark will remain in this cell. Forever. Legend has it, despite plasterings and repaintings, Alexander Campbell's handprint remains. Whether or not the Irish immigrants were guilty or innocent of murder, their executions were a warning to America that big business had become so powerful it could supersede the Constitution. The country's next warning would come 21 years later in a place called Latimer. On September 10th, 1897, about 300 non-union Polish and Hungarian mine workers set out from the Harwood Colliery near Hazelton to encourage mine employees at Latimer to join their walkout. Independent anthracite mines had begun to deduct from their wages a new business tax on employing immigrants. This wage reduction, combined with pugnacious treatment by mine superintendents, drove the immigrant workers to the breaking point. Coal operators called the parade illegal and asked Luzerne County Sheriff James Martin, a former mine foreman, for protection. As the marchers neared the mine at Latimer later that afternoon, Men! they were confronted by Martin and a picket line of over a hundred somber coal and iron policemen, sighting down coal company-issued Winchester rifles. As the sheriff attempted to stop the march, he drew his pistol and pulled the trigger, but his gun failed to fire. The immigrants were not as lucky with the Winchesters. More than a hundred rounds were fired by the deputies, instantly killing eight and hitting more than 40. Some in the back as they ran for safety. As the sun set, the death count rose to 19 and news of the Latimer massacre spread throughout the region and the country. Deputies simply fired on peacefully unarmed immigrants marching from uh, one town to another trying to, to, to make an impression and to get their side of the story told in public. A group of miners that in no way was threatening the deputies that fired upon them. Pennsylvania's governor dispatched 2,500 National Guardsmen the following morning to contain the community's cry for justice. Sheriff Martin and 73 deputies were arrested and charged with murder. A coroner's investigation agreed that the killings were avoidable. The immigrant strike continued throughout a five-week murder trial and swelled to 11,000 minors when the district attorney's inept prosecution helped to return not guilty verdicts for Sheriff Martin and every deputy. Uh, the fix was on before the doors of the courtroom even opened. But the other side of that was that, that led to unifying these men across ethnic lines and was going to be a major step toward uh, unionization. 
The Latimer massacre provided the United Mine Workers exactly the turning point it needed to unite ethnic and Anglo-Saxon mine workers. It inspired in them a common identity based on their occupation. Without anthracite coal, the Industrial Revolution would have been a time of much less heralded accomplishment. Between 1810 and 1910, anthracite became a necessity of commerce and a strategic resource spawning an industrial empire that helped America become less reliant on Europe for key industrial goods like iron and steel. The anthracite era basically transformed America from a primarily an agricultural nation dependent upon wood as its primary material into an industrialization dependent upon iron. Without the iron, we would not have been able to build the railroads. Without the railroads, we wouldn't have had the national transportation network, which was so important in the political unity of the United States. Anthracite was the key. As the anthracite industry matured, transporting hard coal became more profitable than mining it. Railroads began to buy up anthracite rights and buy out smaller mining concerns. Legislators were aware that they were, um, they were giving monopolies to particular railroads and that to allow them to own coal as well as to transport coal would give them a tremendous economic power that might be used to gouge uh, consumers, to take advantage of, of miners. Men who worship false gods may abandon their loyalty. When William McKinley was elected the Republican president in 1896, the politics of business treated the captains of industry as modern-day deities. <laughs> Lincoln Stephens called Pierpont Morgan the boss of America. Fine with me, as long as I'm on his side. At least he's direct. Morgan said from the beginning there were two reasons for controlling the anthracite railroads. A good one, to streamline the industry. And the real ones. Keep out the union. I'd agree to a wage increase before I'd recognize a miners' union. Our President Mitchell is just a bituminous man who came into the anthracite mines to spread rancor among the immigrants. What is this? The courts have always ruled in our favor. It's the public sympathy we need so the White House and Congress can stay focused on the Philippines and China. Europe is replacing private ownership of the mines there with public and private confederations. That's as galling as William Jennings Bryan's rant about workers owning the means of production. My goodness, look at this. This is the world, according to J.P. Morgan. Yes. 35% of revenues from northeastern Pennsylvania is now shipped with anthracite. Nationally, we own three times as much railroad as Harriman in the Union Pacific. If we had to agree to a wage hike, we'd simply continue to leverage the independent operator out of the market and recoup the loss. He'll be in good company. Morgan is running the London Underground Railway now, too. Our capital provides these immigrants here with jobs and, and housing and credit. It isn't our fault if they can't all get along. Where would they be without us? They are to clothe themselves in sackcloth and call on God with all their might let every man abandon his wicked ways and his habitual violence. Mr. Morgan, we'll see you now, gentlemen. It was the book of Jonah he was reading from, a favorite of Pierpont's. I wonder if he thinks of himself as the prophet. Maybe we're the prophets, and Morgan's the great fish that swallows us. Sometimes I think I'd rather go down into the mines. J.P. Morgan uh, had come to have enormous economic power in the anthracite region. His company had made investments and purchased up large chunks of stock in the anthracite railroads so that representatives of J.P. Morgan typically sat on the board of directors of all the major line companies. The Philadelphia and Reading Railroad 
became Anthracite's biggest mining and shipping operation. It was run by George F. Baer, a Civil War veteran groomed by J.P. Morgan to organize all anthracite operations into an economic juggernaut that defined coal policy in the United States. Baer became the defiant voice and the uncompromising face of the anthracite trust. His philosophy was brutally simple. Anthracite mining is a business and not a religious, sentimental or academic proposition. For George Baer, there was no comparison between the property rights of the corporations and the human rights of mine workers. But from across the Atlantic, a wind of change was about to rise and carry upon it a new face for the young nation that would transform the meaning of anthracite coal and profoundly affect the course of American history. Mining was expensive, and eliminating competition was a way to help recover the capital investment in building and maintaining facilities, as well as labor and equipment costs. The coal and rail combination squashed competition by setting anthracite shipping costs at a rate that would wipe out the profits of independent operators. Companies that survived these surcharges were often forced out of business for another reason. They paid a fair wage. When one mine operator was asked why he paid his workers so poorly, he responded, They don't suffer. They can't even speak English. They were the immigrants who came to America between 1881 and 1910 in what is known as the Atlantic Migration. This monumental dislocation of more than 14 million people who sought to escape starvation, poverty, or political and religious repression for them, the United States represented a promise of hope. Tens of thousands of unskilled Eastern and Southern European immigrants speaking 20 languages settled in Northeastern Pennsylvania, where coal companies offered low-paying work in the anthracite mines. Anthracite songs recall the colorful immigrant atmosphere of the hard coal region, and were composed in sweat and blood to convey feelings and fears and heartaches and hopes. Miners and their families restored themselves with music, dance, homemade wine, and polinki, a concoction of beer, whiskey, and red pepper, blended in a wash tub with a broom handle and enjoyed from a tin cup. By 1900, America had over 30 million workers, but no national enforcement of a minimum wage or a limit to hours worked per week. Fewer than two million workers were unionized nationally, and they were viewed by the press and the public as either a destabilizing criminal movement or associated with the Socialist Party. It was a party that uh, differed dramatically from the uh, the ideology and the politics of the Democratic and Republican parties and offered uh, working people and immigrants a rather distinct choice in thinking about the, the nature of the government. Eventually, though, socialism's dissatisfied liberalism conflicted with the prevailing political conservatism of early unions. And like the U.S. government failed to advance the needs of the American worker, so the American worker went at it alone. In 1886, the first significant labor organization in the United States was formed, the American Federation of Labor. Anthracite miners also wanted a guaranteed set of work rights but did not fare as well in their attempts to organize. You think you go back? My papa write me stay here. Be his farm in the Calabria. Never thought I'd miss. And I think it'd be easy in America. But fair, yes. 
I don't care about the union, I just don't work. John Siney, he do what he can for the Irish. <laughs> they still suffer. You lose credit at store if company here you talk about union, or worse. They all treat us like slag we take out of chambers for them. But we should have a right to join union. We're anthracite workers too. Why should the Irish be only ones who work eight hour day? Well, then we form our own union. You want to join Irish eight hour union? You want to be Molly McGuire, eh? <laughs> you want to hang? Then you don't have to worry about uh, go back to Calabria, huh? Everyone act like they own a coal. I spit as much black as anyone. No one fight the coal barons for Irish or us. Or Slavs? Not fair. Union, where men strong together say no like one. I sick of it all. Medicine I need is food. My kids are no work in the mines. I go back first. Shh! Anthony! Giuseppe! Mama looks for you. Cossacks loose tonight. Call police. Papa! Cossacks! <laughs> Language and ethnic divisions, the remoteness of anthracite towns and ethnic bigotry, all proves overwhelmingly difficult for labor organizers to overcome. One who tried was a woman named Mary Harris Jones, better known as Mother Jones. Mother Jones fearlessly appeared in all the great labor conflicts across the country, using her spry sense of humor and dramatic visage to galvanize public sympathy for the hardships of working men, women, and children. She said, I have never had a vote, and I have raised hell all over this country. You don't need a vote to raise hell. You need convictions and a voice. Mother Jones personified the vigor felt in the heart of the mining communities. But her tactics proved a better morale booster than effective labor strategy. It would be left to another noble warrior to transform idealism and commitment into a foundation for the anthracite miners that would create America's largest and most powerful industrial union. By 1890, 30 years of labor organizing in the bituminous fields resulted in the formation of the United Mine Workers of America. But this solidarity would come at a cost. In 1898, 11 miners were killed and 35 wounded in Verdun, Illinois, by state militia protecting African Americans imported to replace striking bituminous miners. The United Mine Workers dispatched its energetic 28-year-old National Vice President, John Mitchell, to support the families of the dead miners. John Mitchell brokered labor agreements that increased wages, reduced hours worked, and successfully addressed health and safety issues for soft and hard coal miners. When he assumed the presidency of the UMWA, the union had been trying to organize the miners in the anthracite fields for four years, and nationally it had less than 30,000 members. Within four years, national membership would increase to 300,000, and almost half of those miners worked in northeastern Pennsylvania's anthracite mines. In 1900, the poverty line in industrial sections of the United States for a family of five was about $460 a year. Most anthracite miners struggled to make even that. Some operators calculated wages based on what was called the equilibrium of empty bellies. Just enough pay to sustain the miner and raise the next generation of mine workers. Death and accident rates were higher in anthracite mining than in bituminous mining, and child labor more prevalent. Mining accidents were torturous for a community. 
Residents stormed a colliery when it heard the three shorts. Three sharp blasts of the breaker whistle that signaled an accident. Between 1869 and 1897, more than 7,000 men and boys were killed in anthracite mines. Almost 18,000 were disabled. Working in the mines at this time was described by miners as dying by inches, sapping them of spirit and health. There, as a miner's legend had it, death waited to blow out his lamp. Most miners were haunted to their graves by debilitating respiratory diseases caused by breathing dust and powder smoke. Their hearing became diminished from the stunted echoes of explosions. Their skin would become permanently mottled with fine coal dust. Many miners developed chronic posture problems from interminable bending due to working in chambers only three to five feet high. A miner's eyes burned in the faint light of a coal mine. His chamber would become thick with coal dust like black snow. A room could suddenly contain asphyxiating heavier gases near the floor or lighter explosive gases near the ceiling. The mines could be cold. Bad drainage created frequent standing water. Rats were prevalent. Hundreds would run throughout a mine. But underground tenderfoots were warned to never kill a mine rat. They could detect a fall or gas. If they scramble up a tunnel, you better too. The Industrial Revolution transformed Western Europe and the United States from an agrarian to an industrial society, and child labor was used extensively. America entered the 20th century afflicted by an epidemic of child labor. In the retail stores and the sweatshops of its growing cities, in eastern textile mills and glass factories, in Gulf Coast canneries. People didn't tend to focus on children working in industry. Um, humanitarians, reformers, some people in government did occasionally, but it always seemed to come right up against the argument that the government should, should not intervene where families determined that there was a need for their children to work. In 1890, nearly 20% of the anthracite labor force was under 16 years of age. Operators wanted cheap labor. Families were desperate for money. The wages for these kids, you know, I think you're probably talking about a dollar fifty a week. You're probably talking about like two cents an hour, three cents an hour, so, you know, on that order. So it's, it's a practical pittance, but so important to the family. But it meant that a, a boy's childhood was truncated very early. When loaded mine cars reached daylight, they went to the tipple, where the coal was tipped into a giant building called the breaker. Here, anthracite was separated from rock called bony and sorted out by size. Most boys in mining communities around 1900 left school by their 12th birthday to help support their families. Their first job working in a colliery would be picking bony while straddling an endless and mesmerizing roar and blur of anthracite passing through the breaker. Their fingers were relentlessly cut from sticking their hands in chutes, picking rock from the coal. New boys learned fingers healed faster if they urinated on them. It was the cracker boss's job to keep the boys productive. He used an oak switch to motivate them. There was no protection from that. It is not in the nature of a nine or ten year old to have a level of concentration, to work steadily, to not daydream. And there were breaker bosses, and their job was to make sure that those kids could do that. He would clobber 
a kid if the kid fell asleep. John Mitchell said of the Breaker Boys, they reminded me of the misery of my childhood. They have the bodies and faces of boys, but came to meetings where I spoke and stood as still as men and listened to every word. I was amazed as I saw those eager eyes peering at me from little eager faces. I felt I was fighting for innocent childhood. The fight had new meaning for me. Miners believed their fate was a test of endurance by God. But as the region's priests celebrated Sunday Mass, the rumble they heard was more than empty bellies. It was the coming industrial war. 125,000 miners walked out of the collieries in the strike of 1900, shutting down the anthracite industry for 43 days and launching the United States into a century of profound heroic change. Republican politicians ultimately did intercede to compel coal and rail operators to agree to a wage increase, the miners' first in 20 years. In their relentless conflict with the industrialists, the miners won the 20th century's first round, but the fight was far from over. When nearly 150,000 anthracite members of the United Mine Workers of America went on strike on May 12, 1902, there was no such thing as a World Series or a World War. For five months, an absence of anthracite coal created a national industrial crisis that affected millions of people in the United States. The strike would become the longest and largest labor conflict in history and reveal that America, the vanguard of modern progress, was in reality a bastion of industrial feudalism. Business leaders thought that labor unions had no business organizing their workers and they refused to believe that a labor union could exist as the legitimate expression of their workers' desires. The strike held the country's attention from its beginning. Smoke ordinances were violated and coal haze began appearing over cities because replacement by tuminous coal burned dirtier than anthracite. But as pollution spread across America's cities, so did public concern. By the end of the strike's first month, critical manufacturing processes were affected, like food preparation and iron smelting. Factories started shutting down because anthracite fired power producing steam boilers. Stores stopped receiving goods. Unemployment rose. Tempers raged in the anthracite region as the coal operators tried to replace striking workers with non-union labor called scabs. Striking miners retaliated against the non-union laborers directly or by dynamiting property like railroad bridges, breakers and offices. As the 19th century gave way to the 20th and spring turned to fall, the anthracite coal famine produced a national political hurricane. At its center was President Theodore Roosevelt. Though detailed reports from Roosevelt's Commissioner of Labor and the Attorney General identified the grave inequities and historical injustices existing in the anthracite industry, they also stipulated that the President had no constitutional authority to end the strike. However, unlike the rest of the country, Theodore Roosevelt wasn't going to just wait for one side to capitulate. This wasn't the new president's style. Roosevelt called the strike a national menace to an essential public service that posed disastrous consequences for America. Despite having no legal justification to do so, 
he urged the commission be constituted to arbitrate a resolution to the strike. John Mitchell publicly welcomed Roosevelt's arbitration offer. Though it had made daily life across America more burdensome than it already was, nowhere was the strike's effects as formidable as in the already impoverished company towns. J.P. Morgan publicly disclaimed any responsibility for the strike, and the anthracite coal and railroad presidents patently rejected Roosevelt's arbitration offer. Instead, mine superintendents were instructed to order miners back to work by the second week in October. Any miner who didn't return to work would be evicted from their company house along with their family. On October 3, 1902, Theodore Roosevelt invited John Mitchell and George Baer to meet with him in Washington. Never before had capital and labor met with an American president to resolve a labor dispute. The present miner has had his day. He has been oppressed and ground down. But there's another generation coming up. A generation of little children prematurely doomed to the whirl of the mill and the noise and the blackness of the breaker. It is for these children that we are fighting. Mr. President, your duty is not to waste time negotiating with the fomenters of this anarchy an insolent defense of law, but to do as was done in the War of the Rebellion. Restore the majesty of the law. No group of men may so exercise their rights as to deprive this country of the things necessary and vital to the common good. Gentlemen, ideally, private ownership should produce initiative and economy. And my duty, Mr. Baer, is to ensure that the basis of American progress and prosperity does not desecrate human life. And the president was able to really um, put pressure on the mine owners and to bring them to a fact-finding process that offered a compromise solution because the uh, living conditions within a large part of the nation were, were threatened by the dwindling stocks of anthracite coal. Ten days after the president found George Bear's loyalty to J.P. Morgan unflinching, he invited the architect of the Anthracite Trust himself to Washington. The next day, the Coal and Railroad Company presidents publicly agreed to the first federal arbitration of a labor dispute. On October 23, 1902, Theodore Roosevelt made history when he impaneled the Anthracite Coal Strike Commission to investigate the causes of the strike and produce a binding award based upon their findings. John Mitchell ordered the nearly 150,000 striking miners to end their 164-day walkout and return to the collieries. The Anthracite Coal Strike as a specific event in American political history marks the first time that an American president intervened in a labor dispute in an even-handed way. Uh, and so it set a kind of precedent that uh, future presidents would ignore at their, uh, at their peril. The Anthracite Coal Strike Commission began its investigation in northeastern Pennsylvania on October 30th, 1902 by touring company towns and descending into the anthracite mines. Two weeks later, on November 14th, the commission convened in Scranton. All six major railroad and coal companies were represented at the hearings, as well as 74 independent operators. Although this was a court proceeding, it wasn't, it, it didn't follow the rules of evidence. Uh, and it did not follow many of the other, you know, uh, procedural aspects that one would have in a trial, for example, or a hearing or anything else. Chief Commissioner George Gray weakened the Miners United Front on the first day when he ruled that non-union miners could be represented by their own counsel. Then the hearings began in dramatic fashion with a four-and-a-half-day cross-examination of John Mitchell. But Mitchell's sharp wit and intelligent testimony left only respect in the minds of the commissioners, lawyers, and the press representing newspapers from across the country. Mr. Mitchell, 
From the outset of this hearing, you've appeared only as the principal spokesman for the striking miners. And as far as this proceeding is concerned, the labor organization of which you are president, the United Mine Workers of America, is not relevant. If you demand an increase in your wages and the coal company managers have no profits, where are they going to place this cost except on the bowed backs of the poor? They might take it out of their profits and so put it on the bowed backs of the rich. As the miners lead counsel, John Mitchell hired a young Clarence Darrow, despite Darrow's lack of knowledge of mining. It reflects on Mitchell's uh, intelligence to select someone that famous as a lawyer who had a reputation for being an outstanding courtroom lawyer. Uh, the thinking being that uh, even his presence in this, uh, in this setting, in this region, uh, would overwhelm him with the opposition. What time of day was it when you were evicted? It was between 8 and 9 o'clock. A very damp morning. I, I said to the sheriff, this is kind of sudden, ain't it? And, and he said, yes, it is very sudden. And I said, well, we're in a terrible fix here. Both of the old people are sick. The old gentleman in particular, he's in bed. I said, I would like if you could give us until tomorrow morning. The sheriff said he would see about it. And then, before I could get back into the house, he came up and he said, you have to get out. In five minutes. piled all of our things out on the street. Why were you evicted? It weren't explained. But I know that others who worked on the relief committee, they were kicked out too. We were only passing out food to the neediest. Now we are one of them. It must have been, uh, you know, just a, a, an amazing type of testimony to to hear this, and really people that never knew what transpired in mines before were learning for the first time the actual conditions of what existed here in the anthracite uh, coal fields. After examining 240 witnesses, the commissioners asked Clarence Darrow to stop. And on December 22nd, 1902, somberly convened the hearing for Christmas. The Anthracite Coal Strike Commission reconvened in early January of 1903 to consider the operator's position. Over 40 days, they would witness a legal passion play, produced by J.P. Morgan and directed by George Baer. Reams of statistics were produced to accuse the United Mine Workers of conducting economic terrorism against America by restricting anthracite output. Capital's closing down. argument was and made, of course, of by George Baer. All over the land, the poor, the honest workmen, and the well-to-do suffered for want of fuel. Today, we have the spectacle of citizens born right in this country not being protected in their right to work. The very smallest of national rights for the protection of which the government was founded. The whole power of our government must be brought to protect the man who wants to work, 
and to strike down any and every hand that would oppress. Though Clarence Darrow considered John Mitchell a man of goodwill, as the hearings neared their conclusion, the two began to argue about summation strategies. John Mitchell's concern was getting uh, the most sympathetic portrayal of the mine workers and their families out to the coal strike commissioners and of course beyond them to the general public. Clarence Darrow had uh, a different interest and was more concerned with pushing a larger and frankly more progressive socialistic uh, political and social agenda. Clearly they had some ideological conflict. Labor unions are for a class because that class exists and has class interests, but it did not create... Not what worried Mitchell was Darrow's reputation in the minds of some politicians and newspaper editors as a radical socialist organizer. A labor organization is a fighting machine for the working man. I believe in the strike. I believe in the boycott. But I believe it ought to be by 10 million men instead of by just a handful. A collective bargaining agreement is not emancipation, John. The working class will be emancipated only by the working class. Emancipation must occur for both master and slave. Tomorrow you will be speaking not for a single cause, but for a half a million men, women, and children sacrificed in this country's calculated effort to secure its position in the world. Get a good night's rest, Clarence. Darrow did, and captured the struggle's essence in an oratory that ignited his legend. This contest is one of the most important that has marked the progress of human liberty since the world began. One force pointing one way, another force the other. Every advantage that the human race has won has been at a fearful cost, at great contest. That suffering endured. Every contest has been a struggle. It has come to these poor miners to bear this cross, but not for themselves, not that, but that the human race may be lifted up to a higher and broader plane than it has ever known before. The Anthracite Coal Strike Commission released its report and award recommendations on March 21, 1903. Its nearly unanimous findings formed the first comprehensive study of the coal industry and acknowledged that each side in the proceedings had merit to their arguments. The commission ruled that wages were inadequate to compensate for anthracite mining's dangerous working conditions. But the quality of life in anthracite communities was no worse than other industrial locations. The commission's major awards included a 10% wage increase for anthracite workers the creation of a sliding scale to increase wages as prices increased. Provisions to ensure coal and mine cars were weighed and distributed fairly and the rejection of a standardized ton because it was deemed impractical. The Commission found the issue of union recognition beyond its jurisdiction. Instead, it proposed a Board of Conciliation to review future grievances the Commission felt workers should have the right to join a union and that collective bargaining was a suitable way to settle labor disputes. But it also supported open shops that provided non-union labor the opportunity to work. The 1902 strike represented a, an important turning point in the history of organized labor in this country. With the success of the 1902 strike, with 
Theodore Roosevelt lending his pressure on behalf of the United Mine Workers of America, you could begin to see uh, the possibility for unionization in industrializing America. That's a very important development. Like the rest of the country following the hearings in the newspapers, the commission was aghast at the abuse of child labor in the anthracite mines and the enlistment of the coal and iron police. Its recommendations help refine the country's industrial policy by contributing to legislation protecting the right of a child to have a childhood. The country had grown. The founding fathers had never envisioned the industrial complexities of, of the United States at the turn of the century. Uh, it really was not prepared to deal with the monopolies, uh, with the fact that hundreds of thousands of people were working in coal mines, uh, with the fact that kids were working in coal mines, the fact that we had people fighting for the miners, that the government was able to step in, that they had such a great mediator like John Mitchell standing up for the rights of the coal miners was a sign that the country was able to adjust going into the 20th century. One of, I think, the great legacies of the anthracite coal region is survival. Here are a group of people who confronted the exploitation, the danger, and yet survived. Not only survived, but built dreams. And I think that's the great meaning for America. Roosevelt's Anthracite Coal Strike Commission set a visionary precedent that redefined the relationship in the United States among organized labor, organized wealth, and the federal government. And the stories from the mines revealed will forever serve as a reminder that the most powerful advancements will still be inspired from the same respect for human dignity fought for nearly a hundred years ago in the dangerous anthracite coal fields of northeastern Pennsylvania. Stories from the Mines is made possible in part by grants from the Pennsylvania Heritage Park Anthracite Alliance, the Lackawanna Heritage Valley Authority, the Delaware and Lehigh National Heritage Corridor, and the Schuylkill River Heritage Corridor, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, the Scranton Times, the Citizen's Voice, and the Tribune, Marywood University, Northeast Educational Intermediate Unit 19, the Scranton Cultural Center at the Masonic Temple, the Scranton Area Foundation, the Willery Foundation, and the Margaret Briggs Foundation.
Thank you.